I think it's very important to recognize that I think the administration was very sincere in its beliefs that there were weapons of mass destruction. Um, I don't think they were quote blind. I think they believed it. You know, as did most Western intelligence agencies believe that there were weapons of mass destruction. I think the problem that they uh, might be held accountable is how they presented that public case for war and what they chose to emphasize, especially Iraq's nuclear uh, capability. But I, I don't know the strength of my critique there. Um, I don't have a sense of how should a president sort of prepare a country for war or argue to the country for war if there's sort of a range of evidence. Do you, do you sort of say, well, you know, we think there's this, but we're told there's only a 75% chance of it. But over here, you know, my guys tell me 99%. I mean, that would not be effective, I think, presidential communication. Um, as for your particular question, were there weapons of mass destruction that were moved elsewhere? I, I don't know. I've you know, seen some of those rumors. Um, I don't know as to their, as to their factuality. Um, We've also seen reports that uh, Iraqi generals uh, firmly believed in the weeks or so before the war that, in fact, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And then he told them, well, no, I don't have them anymore, which you know, was quite extraordinary. So I don't, I don't know, what, you know what exactly to believe. I suppose the question would be, you know, if they were taken out of Iraq, where are they now? Some are more ineffective than others. <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, it's clearly a problem. Um, I mean, it's this notion of a lame duck president. Um, you know, but I think there has been some variation. Um, you know, my sense is that Eisenhower was more successful going out of office, although remember he also had problems with the 1960 summit and so on. Uh, but I think generally his, his last year or two years was a little bit more successful than perhaps you know, some, of his, some of his successors. But we really only, you know, we've, we've got four case studies now. We have Eisenhower, we've got uh, Ronald Reagan, we've got Bill Clinton, and, and now uh, George W. Bush. One last question. Um, I just wanted to kind of go back to the Obama You also said that campaign skills don't necessarily translate to governing skills. But I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the new media kind of idea, where he has this new transition website. He has kind of like a volunteer army. How is that going to affect his transition? And it's kind of a new thing. So I'm kind of wondering if you could talk briefly about that. No, I think um, the technology surrounding uh, transitions is really accelerating Tremendously. I would point out, however, that it was uh, George W. Bush and his people who first created a website in, in 2000 to do, to do their transition. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the Obama website, what is it, change.gov, um, is not unique in that, uh, in that regard. Um, I think there is a danger. And here, I think the, the Clinton transition alerts us. And that is if there is too much continuation of campaigning into the transition period, where the notion is that, OK, we're positioning the president to build even more popularity than was achieved during the election. That, at times, I think, can be a bit distracting. Um, I think you're right that there has, you know, it, 
it's not an immediate, and I don't want to suggest it's an immediate cutoff between a campaign mode and a governing mode. Because effective governance also involves a public presidency and effective communication strategies during that presidency and effective dealings with the media during that, during that presidency. But I think the problem is that there has to be some balance so that the campaigning part that they were used to doesn't overwhelm, doesn't overwhelm the, the, the governing part. And said something interesting else, party question. Do you, do you remember what it was at the first part? Okay. No. <laughs> but it was a good, it was a good question. Um, but it is, I think it is, it, it will be fascinating to see this particular t transition um, unfold and how it, you know, how given the difficulties surrounding this presidency at this point in time, um, two world wars, economic instability, financial crisis, uh, deficits that we haven't seen historically. Um, I think all of that is going to make you know, this transition and what um, proceeds out of this transition in the early part of uh, Obama's presidency uh, fascinating sort of fodder for those of us who study these things. Thank you. Thank you. As a token of our appreciation for your excellent uh, presentation, even if it hadn't been excellent, we'd give this to it. <laughs> but thank you very well, much. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we're going to have a 15 minute break. We're going to uh, come back at 9 30 for a panel Presidential Powers and George W. Bush with Louis Fisher, Dale Hurstspring, and Mitch Sollenberger. And, uh, just stay around this area. I think the, uh, there are additional materials out on the table out there if you have not picked them up yet. And we're off to a great start. I thank you very much. Uh, Professor Fears has joined us uh, from last night. Thank you for that again. And thank you, uh, Professor Burke, again, for a great start this morning. We're going to have a great day today. Thank you. I love their development work too. So I've been here 